Welcome in Bills Mafia. On tonight's Air Raid Hour, we will be breaking down all things interior defenders in the 2024 NFL draft. Who goes where? Who do we like? Who do we think best fits the Buffalo Bills? And where does the value lie at this position in the NFL draft? We attempt to answer those questions tonight, but first... Hour, a cover one network podcast. Here are your hosts, Judge Mathis and Tilt Money. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another Sunday edition of the Air Raid Hour. Don't worry, we will be on again tomorrow night at 9 p.m. breaking down safeties, just like we're going to be doing with interior defenders tonight. But uh, my life's kind of a train wreck right now, living out on the West Coast. I live in Arizona, and we don't, we don't practice daylight savings time out here. So the clocks went from a two-hour time difference to a three-hour time difference, and that's really messing with me and my schedule. So thank everyone, and thank you, Dave, for, for being patient with me because I am the problem child in this situation. So if you don't like these Sunday night air raid hours, you can, uh, you can go on ahead and blame me. Uh, but welcome in, David. I'm excited to break down these interior defenders tonight. Yeah, I think one thing we we really need to maybe just recall back on it and kind of sh- stress again, right, is the fact that before free agency started, we were thinking, oh, my God, like, okay, yes, we got Ed Oliver, and, and that's all we got, but we got no one at the one tech, and yeah. we spent a lot of time, even pre-free agency, kind of looking at, like, one tech prospects in the draft, and I think things have now shifted, right, with the signing mm-hmm. of the re-signing of Daquan Jones, and the signing of Austin Johnson. I think our priorities now to the draft may have shifted. So it's been an interesting exercise to kind of pivot away, maybe from diving Mm -hmm. into some of the one tech prospects now, maybe focusing on some of the three tech prospects in this class. So fun, fun pivot there, but that's why free agency uh, really shapes the draft, right? Yeah. I mean, since we last podcasted, the Buffalo bills added not one, not two, not three, but four, New free agents in safety, Mike Edwards, one tech interior defender, Austin Johnson, edge rusher, Casey Tuhill, and guard center, Will Clapp. So as the Bills almost always do every offseason, they are sort of plugging every single hole on the roster with serviceable players so that they don't have to go out and reach on draft day. And as you mentioned, one of the biggest ramifications on this show is there will likely now be more of an emphasis on three tech because if there is a glaring hole on this roster, it is, Hey, what happens if Ed Oliver gets hurt? Because all the other defensive tackles on the roster are now one techs. And then tomorrow night, the emphasis on the show, um, you know, probably us not feeling the urgency to have to take a safety at pick 60, maybe feeling a little bit better with Mike Edwards in tow, being able to wait until round four to take a safety Less, a little less pressure maybe on that tiering show tomorrow night. Yeah, things have certainly shifted. I mean, you could still probably justify safety early. Given my words is there on a one-year contract. Um, but three tech now becomes super important. And, you know, Brandon Bean, he talked about in the press conference, like emphasis on the trenches. And to be honest, like I'm kind of like getting into this mindset of like, let's go ham on the defensive line. Like, give me some... Give me some pre- give me a premium pick on someone on the defensive mm-hmm. line, maybe uh, another pick later on in the draft or, or multiple, right? We have a, a, all these picks as it stands, but like the defensive line is just one of these conversations we have every year. It's in a slightly different angle every year, but it's always the same type of conversation around how do we get this defensive line right this year? Mm-hmm. And at times the bills have gotten it right. But in big moments, at times they haven't, and obviously injury has to has something to do with that. But man, this this backup three tech behind Ed Oliver really more important than maybe people um, even realize. 
Yeah, Brandon Bean obviously had his press conference from the owners' meetings in Orlando today. If you guys haven't had a chance, go check it out on all the Buffalo Bills, various different multimedia platforms. It was a really good listen, about 25 minutes long. He spoke, spoke and took questions from the media, including calling out the NFL for what he believes is hosing them out of a, yeah. a third round draft pick. I was really surprised he didn't, you know, toe the logo line, right? He legitimately called out the NFL and said he believed that they were ripped out of a, a, a third round pick. But the trenches, which he emphasized a ton, he's like, if we're going to invest anywhere, we're going to be investing big money in the trenches. And he was speaking towards free agency in that point, but the trenches are more than just defense as well. I think one of the position groups we haven't really talked about that much, and we're going to tar- start talking about next week as we do some of these more position tiering shows, is the offensive line. Because if you look at it, we lost some dudes specifically on the interior in Mitch Morris and Ryan Bates. Now we've filled those slots. David Edwards slides into the left guard spot. Connor McGovern slides over to center. You've added Will Clapp. You have now Alec Anderson coming into his third year. You expect him to sort of take the next step and become a uh, more maybe reliable backup or maybe even compete for the starting left guard spot. But it really wouldn't shock me sitting at pick number 28 We talk about how historically loaded this wide receiver class is. If there is a tackle on the board still at 28 and the Bills can maybe envision them playing left guard for a year and competing with David Edwards, Spencer Brown has his contract up at the end of this season. Draft a guy now to play left guard, transition him over to right tackle in 2025. That could be something the Buffalo Bills could realistically, I think, consider at 28. Or maybe if that's too rich for some people, pick 60. Guys like Roger Rosengarten and stuff will be on the should be on the board or could be on the board as well. So I think free agency is really starting to change the narrative of what the Buffalo Bills are going to do in this draft, as you said at the top of the show. And I think to the point you made about the tackle class being deep, and I did start a bit um, diving in on the tackles today, Mm -hmm. even though that's not really the topic of our show. Uh, Similar to wide receiver, I think for me, there's enough depth at that position in this draft that I would be comfortable taking a a middle round tackle in this draft and knowing what the Bills have still to fill on this roster for 2024, knowing that Spencer Brown is here, at least for this year. TBD, whether he gets an extension, Mm -hmm. I think for me personally right now, unless something really weird happens, I would probably not necessarily want the bills to take a tackle at 28, but I could be, I could be talked into it depending on who it is. All right. The topic of tonight's show is going to be interior defenders, but first this show is sponsored by Picasso's pizza Four great locations in Williamsville, West Seneca, Lancaster, and Blaisdell. Buffalo Pizza since 1980. You can order online at picassospizza.net. And if you're an out-of-towner like us, you can even get it mailed to your home. And I can tell you from experience, it is just as good as getting it fresh from the restaurant. Again, that is picassospizza.net. Order now. Get it shipped just in time for draft day, and you'll have your Picasso's Pizza as you watch, hopefully, Cover One's coverage of the 2024 NFL Draft. But we're going to start with IDLs today. And before we get started tiering, again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up on the board my projection tier. And I need to make it clear, this is where I think guys will get drafted. This isn't necessarily where you and I would rank these players. And that's the whole point of the conversation. Where do we think the value lies in the draft? Who do we think could be you know, overrated, somebody we, we wouldn't want to touch in a certain place. Who do we think is underrated? Those are the type of conversations we're going to have tonight. And I've made these tiering lists based on just things that I've heard, things that I've read. I devote probably way too much time scouring the internet for all the various news reports, reading about pro days, reading about all these things, listening to God knows how many podcasts talking about NFL draft prospects. So that's how I've gone about creating these projection tiers. That also being said, I want it to be known because a lot of times people are like, well, this person will never go in this round or you don't have enough people in this tier. You don't have enough people in that tier. I try to take a mathematical approach to these tiers as well. 20 interior defensive linemen have been taken on average over the last three drafts. So I have on my board in my tiers only 20 
interior defensive linemen. Mm. meaning that there are probably going to be some guys who don't make these tiers who I project as undrafted free agents. Could they get drafted in the sixth or the seventh round? Yes, they sure certainly could. And we will talk about some of those guys at the end of the show, but I try to stick to what I think is a realistic number and that is 20. And then I also like to look at how many guys go early in the draft. Mm. 11 interior defensive linemen went in the first three rounds last year, but that was the exception. Seven went in 2022 and only five in 2021. That's a three-year average of eight defensive tackles in the first three rounds. So I only put eight guys in my first three tiers. So Mm. some people might be shocked by some of the names I have in like tier four or tier five. But I think if you look at the numbers, some guys are going to be had later in this draft than we think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean. those averages are kind of telling, right? I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. pretty eye opening. And like, we think like six hundred guys are going to get drafted, and that's not the case, right? So it's <laughs> like, I mean, 20, 20 on average. And how many years back did you say that was? How many years? Three, did you check? three years. That, that's that's pretty solid um, sample size. I feel mm-hmm. like so. Uh, and, be interesting and- to see if like that average has come down recently but i mean even still right 20 over the last three years is is lower probably than people thought i really hope the buffalo bills don't trade up in this draft mostly because i really feel like round four is going to be a sweet spot where we can get two quality players with those two picks in the fourth round so i'm hoping if we do trade up we don't utilize that fourth round pick so let's get into our first tier here and actually, I'm, I'm going I'm to put the first two tiers together. And the first two tiers that I have are Byron Murphy the second, Johnny Newton out of Illinois, and Braden Fisk out of Florida State. Now, some people might be taken aback a little bit by Johnny Newton being in that second tier of first, second round picks. But I do think it's important to note the dude hasn't played football since November. He didn't take part in the senior bowl. He didn't take part in the combine. He didn't take part in his pro day. He's hoping to have his own private workout in front of scouts in April before the draft. But until I start hearing some more buzz around Johnny Newton, I think he could be a real realistic option for the Buffalo Bills at pick 28, because I think there might just be a a, a scenario where other dudes are rising up draft boards, rising up the pre-draft process while Johnny Newton really doesn't have the ability to partake in this pre-draft process. So it could be a boon to the Buffalo Bills who need that backup to Ed Oliver. So let's start with these first three in the first two tiers, Byron Murphy, Johnny Newton, Braden Fisk. If the Buffalo Bills want any of these guys, they'll probably have to trade up for a Byron Murphy. I, I wouldn't even be shocked if he goes well before the Buffalo Bills even have the ability to trade up. I think they're lucky if a guy like Johnny Newton slips to them. Braden Fisk might be a bit of a reach, but I think he's a top 40 pick. So the Bills have no shot at him, I think, at pick 60. So these are the top three guys in my tiers, and all three of them happen to be that three-tech role. All three of these guys happen to be sort of slightly comped in one way or another to a guy like Ed Oliver. This is interesting because I think if two two of those guys, let's just say Newton and Fisk are still there at 28, Mm -hmm. I would be really tempted, and again, obviously, it depends on how the rest of the board is falling, but I would be really tempted to see if I could move back at that point, um, even if it's a, only a handful of spots, right? Because who knows? Maybe you move back out of the first round at that point. Maybe you go from mm-hmm. 28 to, like, you know, the mid-30s, and you don't move down a ton, but maybe you get an extra fourth or a fifth-round pick by doing that, and then you can use that as ammo. Like you said, you don't want to lose both those fourth-round picks, to maybe get yourself back into the third round. And then all of a sudden you have two picks in the second round, uh, two pick, you know, a pick in the third round and two picks in Mm. the fourth. If that's the kind of guy that you're targeting, right? Because yes, it is about getting the guy you want, but it's also kind of trying to get the most value out of the spot you're picking as well. Um, I could be, I could be okay with either two of those guys at 28, but I think if I had my, my way i would rather trade down a few spots if someone was willing Mm -hmm. to come up and and there was someone else that they wanted um to see if i could just squeeze a little bit of extra value out of that and then maybe still land one of those guys in the mid 30s now if only one of them is left Mm -hmm. let's say then someone else likely fell that maybe they they go away from that position altogether or they might just have to take that guy at 28 
Yeah, I, I'm with you if the answer is Braden Fisk. Like, if it's Braden Fisk, I'm willing to make a trade back and try to get back into the early second round because, man, would it be fun to have a second round pick, two second round picks, a third round pick, two fourth round picks? Like, mm-hmm. now we're playing with fire because I think that's where the value lies in this draft. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what the value is going to be at pick 28, but there certainly is some value at 28. If Johnny Newton is there, I think Johnny Newton is the real deal. I think he is, has been one of the premier interior disruptors in college football over the last two seasons. If an injury was to drop him to us at pick 28, again, you have to look at what the board looks like. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. When we talk about what the Buffalo bills are going to do day one, we're going to look at all the various different day one options for the Buffalo bills. If Johnny Newton is a day one option and he is on the board at pick 28 and Pete Dana comes in and says Newton is his DT one, I think he's a lot of people's DT ones. I would be running that card up to the, to the, to the board because I feel like there would be very hard for me to feel like there would be another prospect on the board. I would be as excited about as Johnny Newton and the thought of, and I get it. I, I get why fans are mad, right? Like, oh, he's a rotational player. He only plays like 30% of the snaps or this or that. Like, imagine Ed Oliver, but Ed Oliver getting a chance to just go 150% in every play because he doesn't have to play as many snaps. Imagine Ed Oliver and Johnny Newton on the field at the same time in pass rushing situations. Mm-hmm. You are affecting the quarterback. You are disrupting the pocket from the interior you are allowing Matt Milano, Terrell Bernard to make plays. You are probably putting Gregory Rousseau and AJ Epinesa in their best position to be sort of those edge setting cleanup guys Mm -hmm. with all that interior disruption. I just think it does so much for your defense. I think he's an impact pro bowl caliber player. And when you have a chance to get a guy like that at 28, I just don't think you pass. I think Braden Fisk is a very, very good player. I think he will be a, very high-end interior defender. Will he be a future pro bowler? I I don't know if Braden Fisk will ever get there. I think he'll be a fun player along a defensive line. I think he'll be a player that fans of whatever team drafts him loves because of what he brings to the football team. I don't know if he's going to impact a football game as consistently as a guy like, like Johnny Newton. Yeah, and and for the people that are maybe against taking an interior defensive lineman at that pick and – a lot of this is because people really want mm-hmm. a wide receiver or otherwise. Like, let's not forget kind of how things have gone for the Bills in the playoffs or when one guy gets injured on this defensive line, how things just seem to just drastically fall apart for this team. Like Daquan Jones guns out. The the defense held it together as good as they could. They were they were admirable. I get that. But like you need mm-hmm. four solid like really close to top end guys, I think on the interior in this bill's defensive scheme, the bill's finally making that true investment in the backup one tech that we've been asking for, for forever. What it seems like going back to the days they had Mm -hmm. star. Now we got Austin Johnson behind Daquan Jones. Let's get that guy behind Ed Oliver that we can have four studs. Right. And like, I'll, I'll call Austin Johnson a stud for what he's going to be, which is a backup Mm -hmm. one tech. Get a get a premier premier rookie with huge um upside to back up at Oliver like that that's a that's a scary duo for the future so um and cost controlled by the way too yep. so yeah I I could be on board and if the Buffalo Bills do decide to go uh, another direction in round one this next tier of guys who are second and third round picks and some of them might not be on the board when the Buffalo Bills pick at 60. They might have to consider trading up for some of these guys. You have Tavondre Sweat, who we talked about at length, like at length. We spent like 20 minutes on him when we talked about (laughs) the senior bowl. Not as much of a conversation anymore with Daquan Jones and Austin Johnson under contract, but a guy like Chris Jenkins, he's a three tech, one tech flex out of Michigan. He's, you know what you're getting out of him against the run. And he has a very, like they call him the mutant for a reason. His testing numbers were incredible. He has pass rush upside. He can be a three tech, one tech flex. You get the best of the both worlds out of Chris Jenkins. You have Mazon Smith out of LSU. He's now two years removed from an ACL. He started to get hot towards the end of last season. He just hasn't played a lot of football, but when pre-injury, he was looking dominant and he has the physical stature of a Leonard Williams, of a Jeffrey Simmons. That's the type of 
athlete. That's the type of body a Maison Smith has. So you get really excited. And I think even though the production hasn't been there because of injuries for him, I think GMs are going to salivate and he's going to go earlier than people think. Probably the best name in this draft out of Clemson, Rook Arororo. Uh, he gives you shades of, of Ed Oliver as well as that sort of feisty, athletic, combative, three-tech and then you have one of our personal faves and a guy we talked about with the senior bowl. And that is Dwayne Carter, where you're getting a little bit, I think with the best of both worlds where yes, you're probably going to want him to play three tech, but you could probably see him playing a little bit of one tech as well. So a lot of like when we signed Tim settle, right? What we thought we were getting with Tim settle. I think Dwayne Carter can be what we thought Tim settle could be if he reached his peak. That's the kind of guy I think Dwayne Carter is. And I mean that as a compliment, even though utilizing that name might make it sound like an insult. So that's tier three. What do you like about this tier three? What do you like about some of these guys the Buffalo Bills could consider if we don't go defensive tackle with our first pick? Well, I don't think Sweat's an option, just realistically, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just doesn't fit. One, he already didn't fit what the Bills look for, even in a one tech as far as the size. I mean, he's a spe he's a great two down player. Don't get me wrong. I would have loved to add him, um, you know, maybe even in the second round, right? Uh, that was before free agency started. Mm -hmm. I think now he's probably not a realistic option for the bills in that tier, in that group of guys, right? We just, we had, we have the two one techs. He's not really an archetype one tech that we typically go after. So I, I think he's probably off the guy that's intriguing is Chris Jenkins, right? Because I think to me, there could be some people who look at Chris Jenkins and say, I like Chris Jenkins more than I like Braden Fisk, right? There could be people that mm -hmm. say that. A and he's got that ability to kind of play multiple roles on the interior, which you mentioned. And I think obviously he's got the pedigree played for that big, big time program. He's not necessarily a box score stat stuffer, mm -hmm. uh, box score stuffer, but that's okay. Like you got to look beyond that a bit and, and kind of look at some of the measurables from a guy like Chris Jenkins and some of the, some of the things that he can bring to a team as far as the versatility in the interior um, athleticism there as well. I, for me, like that would be the guy if like somehow the bills passed, let's say on, let's just say Newton wasn't there or maybe the bills pass on Newton at 28. Let's just say, and like somehow you get through like Newton Fisk and maybe Jenkins is sitting there somehow still in the second round at 60. Like that would be very interesting to me if the bills hadn't gone defensive tackle in the first round, I would probably will be willing to, to go for a guy like Chris Jenkins in round two, if, mm -hmm. if that was the case. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see what the decision the bills make here. Chris Jenkins sticks out to me. Like there's not a single name here that the bills could draft at pick 60 that I would be upset with. If the pick comes in, it's Chris Jenkins. I'm excited. If the pick comes in, it's Maison Smith. I'm excited. If it comes in, it's Rook Aurora. I'm excited. If it comes in, it's Dwayne Carter. I'm ecstatic because I think Dwayne Carter might actually be my favorite of that group. I know he's a, a, a favorite of yours as well out of Duke. So there are a ton of really good defensive tackles there. So if the Buffalo Bills do not get one at 28, I think they have their options there at 60. Once we get past that, we now get into tier number four. Tier number four to me are guys who are probably going to hear their names called in the third round or the early fourth round. So it, maybe some of these guys get to the Buffalo Bills in the fourth round, but I think if we don't get a defensive tackle in the first round, if we don't get a defensive tackle in the second round, I think at least the top two names on this list, which I know are yours and my favorites on this list, it's going to be a struggle, I think, for the Buffalo Bills to get their hands on these two players. The first in this tier four is Gabe Hall out of the University of Baylor. He is a guy who the Buffalo Bills are probably very familiar with because he played under Dave Aranda. Dave Aranda, Sean McDermott have a relationship going all the way back to Trey White and Terrell Bernard. So we know that there's a connection there. You have Michael Hall Jr. out of Ohio State, the highly sought after recruit. He maybe has underperformed in college, but he's packed on some weight, almost 300 pounds. Uh, he had a great senior bowl. He had a good combine. He is another guy who is a three tech who could slate behind Ed Oliver. You have a big bulky one tech in Tyler Davis, who again, 
might no longer be someone the Buffalo Bills consider given the state of their depth chart. And then you have Justin uh, Aboji out of the University of Alabama, who I think is a pretty solid three tech as well. Sort of sort of a run of the mill three tech, a guy who's going to plug in and be your DT4, but he can be your DT4 for a very long time. And I don't think you'll have very many complaints about him. So is the ceiling there for a guy like Justin Ibogi? Probably not, but I think he's got a pretty high floor. So that's a pretty good third tier as well. And I know you're excited about a couple of players on that list. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like, okay, so <laughs> obviously we're pivoting away from the one text. I like Jefferson, more of a one tech mm-hmm. guy. I'm kind of like mm, whatever on him now. The Hall brothers, brothers, they're not really brothers. I like <laughs> Michael Hall a little bit more than Gabe Hall, but again, the connection to Baylor cannot be, right, cannot be understated mm-hmm. there. And you start to kind of go down the list of some of these guys and as far as how they tested, like Gabe Hall and Michael Hall, both over 9.2 uh, Gabe Hall 9.2 Raz mm-hmm. and Michael Hall 9.27 Raz were two of the highest um, athletically as far as testing. They were two of the highest in this entire interior defensive line class. So if people are looking at the board and they're looking at guys that have traits that have athleticism, guys that can be disruptors in the passing game, which I th- really like Michael Hall mm-hmm. um, it, it, in that regard. Right, um, 11th best pass rush grade in 2023 of all IDLs per PFF, seventh most hurries of all IDLs in 2023. Um, you know, he's at a, an athletically gifted guy compared to a lot of these other guys in this sort of realm. So, I think for me, Michael Hall out of that group, and obviously, he's the first or second guy on your list there, is probably the guy that I would, if he's there in the fourth round and we hadn't taken a defensive tackle yet, I would be ecstatic if the Bills picked a guy like that. And it looks like uh, I'm finally, finally agreeing with Josh mm-hmm. Allen as the next Elway on something <laughs> with, around with Logan Lee because I was talking yeah. about him earlier today. So don't agree with him on the Justin Shorter take, but I do agree with him on the mm-hmm. Logan Lee tape. Iowa guy, we know the Bills like Iowa guys. When I watched the game, a couple games of Iowa today when I had some time, I really liked what I saw from him penetrating, um, driving, going after guys with one arm, really getting into the backfield played a ton of snaps as Pete Nana and I were talking about this earlier and probably some of his advanced metrics don't look as good because of that. But I really like Logan Lee as well in that kind of next group down. Yeah. You look at a guy like Logan Lee out of Iowa as well, like former tight end, right? Switched to defense at his time at Iowa. So he's six foot five, 281. He's got room to add to that frame. So he might not be a guy that like has an impact year one, like he'll have an impact as part of a rotation, but in terms of being like an every down guy, he can add to that frame in an NFL weight room. And I really don't have too many concerns. Like he can get up to 290, 295. Logan Lee could be looked at as one of the steals of this draft, but I just want to go back to, to Gabe Hall here for a second here. And the thing that you get with Gabe Hall, and I, I can already tell you guys right now, when we do our no matter what show, Gabe Hall is going to be my no matter what defensive tackle. He is my favorite defensive tackle prospect in this class. I'm not saying he's the best. I'm just saying he's my favorite. And I think he checks a lot of boxes of what the Buffalo Bills like. He's got really good size at six foot six. You're a little concerned about the weight at 291. That's below the percentile you would like to see, but he does look like he can add to that frame. And on top of that, he's got 34 and a half inch arms, which I think is something that's really important to the Buffalo bills. He by Raz calculations had good agility grades, great explosion grades and great speed grades. It's the explosion part that I think is really going to pop with the Buffalo bills. He was di disruptive at the senior bowl everyone i've talked to that was in mobile talked about what a disruptor gabe hall was and how he would just explode off the line of scrimmage at the snap and he would wreak havoc on the interior on top of all of that he's a guy that even though his position is three tech he can move around they had him in mobile lining up at nose guard And either three tech spot, he's long, he's quick, he's strong. That's what you're getting with Gabe Hall. You are getting a guy who's going to 
have an explosive first step. He's going to force people lateral. He's going to be probably a guy the Buffalo Bills really like from a character and size perspective. Gabe Hall's my dude. Like, mm-hmm. that's why I really wish we had a third round pick because <laughs> he would have been etched in stone. Look at this my comment, third round pick. <laughs> so uh, to me, that is the one that I, 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 that's the number one reason I'm really mad that we got ripped off of that third round pick, because if it costs us a guy like Gabe Hall, that's going to be something that is rather upsetting to me. Um, Looking at some of these other guys, and you mentioned Logan Lee already, so let's take a look sort of at the rest of the defensive tackles on this board. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the fourth and the fifth round guys, and we could talk about the late day three guys as well. Christian Boyd has a confirmed top 30 visit with the Buffalo Bills. Mm-hmm. He is a one tech. He was probably the biggest combine snub out of yep. Northern Iowa. He has really risen since the Shrine Bowl and the Hula Bowl during this pre-draft process. Jordan Jefferson is another one tech defender who probably is sort of erased off the Buffalo Bills board at this point, unless they make the decision to double dip at defensive tackle. Who knows? They could go in a completely different direction than we expect. But really, it's kind of hard to diff. It's kind of difficult to understand them drafting another one tech and leaving that other three tech spot completely vacated. You got Makai Wingo, who's risen up, had a really good combine. This is a mid round three tech. This is what we're talking about. Same with Logan Lee. This is a mid round, mm-hmm. late day three. I think he ends up going in the, the fifth or the sixth round. Logan Lee, three tech. McKinley Jackson, he's a big, beefy, like zero tech. Like he is not a guy I think the Buffalo Bills will have much interest in out of Texas AM. Leonard Taylor, the third, has been extremely disappointing in the pre draft process out of the University of Miami. A lot of people were talking about him as sort of a day two guy. Keith Randolph Jr., that's another one tech. You know, Jaden Crimity Krim- out of Mississippi State, that's another one tech. So a lot of one techs here on this day three board, which really makes me think the Buffalo Bills kind of walk out of the first four rounds with their three tech. Yeah. And I, I think that like before free agency, it was kind of like setting up nice as far as the bills trying to get a one tech here in like the the Mm -hmm. fourth, fifth round. Um, as Pete Nana here says, all the day three, one techs have nice floors, a really solid group. And I I agree with him. Like Mm -hmm. Jordan Jefferson was a guy I really liked. You knew that obviously we talk about Randolph who was Johnny Newton's running mate there at Illinois. Um, I mean, the dude had like 13 tackles for loss in 2022. You know, he came back down to earth a little bit in 2023, but like insane numbers for a guy like Keith Randolph Jr. But again, a one tech type of guy. So then you start to pivot and you start to look at maybe the running mates of some of these other guys. So like who is Jordan Mm -hmm. Jefferson's running mate? Who's Mason Smith's running mate? You got Makai Wingo, who is that three tick, three tech build four and a half sacks from the interior for him. Last year was in the top 10 for interior defensive linemen as far as sack numbers, right? And this size, he's a little smaller, mm-hmm. right? I mean, he's what, two, what did I, what did I see? He's at two, uh, 280. Two, two 280. 280. So uh, see, like even a little smaller than Ed Oliver, but Hey, if he's going to bring you some pass rush pop, that's kind of mm-hmm. what the type of guy you're looking for. So it does thin out a bit though. You're right. And so, ah. Uh, I don't know. You might have to have a guy in hand by the fourth round. It, it, it mm-hmm. certainly looks like if you're looking for a three tech that can contribute right away. Right. Yeah. I mean, Makai Wingo is a guy who a lot of people started to gravitate towards at the combine. And when you look at his sort of analytical profile here, and I'm just trying to pull up my, my notes here real quick on him. But like I said, this is really, if you look at it, Wingo and Logan Lee, to me, that's sort of, that's the end of the line when it comes to uh, the three techs. And I'm struggling to pull them up here in my notes. Where is he? Here he is. Um, I mean, you look at a guy like Makai Wingo, like you said, in the 280s. Eight plus Raz, there. though. So obviously, yeah. Profile. Six foot, 284. Nine and one fourth inch hands, 32 inch arms. But like his his NFL.com comp was to a guy like Sheldon Rankins, a shade undersized. He's going to give you like Kevin Givens vibes, right? That's mm-hmm. the kind of Maurice Hurst vibes. 
that's the kind of player you're getting. And that's the kind of player I envision the Buffalo Bills maybe pursuing to be that fourth defensive tackle. So really, it is Makai Wingo and Logan Lee sort of rounding out I agree. those three techs. Because after that, it's a lot of like three tech, one tech flex guys. It's a lot of one tech guys. You go in, you start to dip into my UDFA pool. Fabian Lovett Sr. was Braden Fisk's running mate. I love Fabian Lovett Sr. I think he's going to be a really good fourth defensive tackle in somebody's rotation. He's more of a one-tech, three-tech flex. Miles Murphy is a pure one-tech out of North Carolina. He had a good shrine week, but he's just a big, beefy body. Same with Zion Logue out of Georgia. Justin Rogers out of Auburn. I really like uh, I like Evan Anderson out of FAU. Maybe the Buffalo Bills can see him as a three-tech, one-tech flex and draft him. And then you have Marcus Harris out of Auburn, who's another interesting three-tech. I know Anthony Prohaska is a big fan of Marcus Harris. So maybe that's somebody, if the Buffalo Bills don't get a three-tech early, to keep an eye on. And then there is one more player, and I'm going to pull up my notes on this player real quick, that I have on record here. And that player is out of the my backyard here, Arizona State University. I think a really good sort of end of the draft type of three tech. I have him currently slated as a priority free agent is Deshaun Mallory out of Arizona State University. He had a chance to finally play this year, transferred from Michigan State. He's a little bit on the smaller side as well in the 280 pound range, but he's a guy who was really good at exploded explosive first step, forcing guys lateral, impacting in both the run and the pass game for an Arizona State defense that was pretty solid in the 2023 season. So that's sort of the last of the three texts that I have. But Marcus Harris, a guy like Deshaun Mallory, like that's pushing it in terms of contributing for the Buffalo Bills in 2024. You're looking for a guy to come in and instantly contribute. Michael Hall Jr. is probably, the, that's probably the floor, right? Yep, I agree. I, I like Makai Wingo. I like Logan Lee. I don't know if I'm going to get day one production out of them, even in a rotation. Maybe Justin Igboji from Alabama, like, but that's 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 the floor. So you got to get out of the fourth round if you want a true backup to Ed Oliver. And Brandon Bean talked about how important the trenches were. So if that specific trait is important to the Buffalo Bills, that is where that's that's the line. Right, that is where you have to have a probably walk out of this draft with a defensive tackle by the end of round four. Man, I wish we had a third round pick. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to say this every day on every show. Trade back, until, team trade back. God, and this is why, like, to me, it's the three texts thin out the mm -hmm. the ones that can contribute. I should say probably mm -hmm. on day one thin out quite quickly, and if those numbers hold, right, the average of twenty over the last three years, maybe you get a, mm -hmm. a, one of the Hall brothers in round four and it falls into your lap. You know, who knows? Maybe the Bills do go wide receiver in round one and in round two there's, you know, I don't know, maybe there's an edge guy or a safety or someone that they love in round two so they pass on interior again and then maybe one of the mm -hmm. Hall brothers are there in round four and it kind of evens out. But it would be nice if the if Brandon Bean could maybe maneuver a bit uh, and look – we were we're hosting the coverage on night one Thursday night mm -hmm. for the draft, and I wouldn't be totally disappointed if the Bills didn't end up making a pick that night. So I, yeah, just, I would I, I would not be disappointed either. Last couple of years, I was excited when we traded up. Uh, I will be excited if we trade out and we just completely waste our time there on night one. And then there's there's also this to consider too: the way that we're viewing these players. It doesn't always line up with the way NFL teams or even just Brandon Bean specifically views these players. There could be players that we have talked about. We're like, oh, that's a one tech. Oh, that's a space eater. Oh, that's this. That's that. And the Bills are like, no, we think they're three tech, one tech flex. We love their pass rush pop. The combination of Austin Johnson and this and that. And we can kick Gregory or so in if we really need to on this down. Like, there could be a plan in place and there could be a name that we're not emphasizing right now that the Buffalo Bills could very well prefer over some of the guys that that we have sort of highlighted here tonight.
Well, that's an interesting thought, right? Because that's a that's a philosophy mm -hmm. shift, which is not impossible. Or, or and Brandon Bean's been willing to maybe pivot, maybe instead of having like as we've had in the past, we've really just had the one true one tech and tried to kind of have a bunch of three techs rotate in and out. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we go the other way around. We find like a a, a one tech archetype body yeah. body type that maybe has a little pass rush pop in that. Maybe that's the answer, right? Because um, we'll see. Because the conversation we had, right, was, man, why did we? Why the heck did we sign Tim Settle? Remember, like we've had this conversation multiple times. Why do the Buffalo Bills keep playing Tim Settle at one tech? Why do the Buffalo Bills keep playing Tim Settle at one tech? We want him to play three tech. You look, the Buffalo Bills now have two true one techs, and Austin Johnson and Daquan Jones. You look at Tim Settle's measurables, 6'2 and 3 fourths. I think he slimmed down to about 315, but he was 329 at the NFL Combine, 33-inch arms. That dude had the body of a one-tech but played like a three-tech. Mm -hmm. So maybe a guy like Jordan Jefferson sticks maybe. out to the Buffalo Bills, right? Okay. Maybe the Buffalo Bills see something because I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Everything I know about Christian Boyd, the guy they have coming in for a top 30 visit, is he blew up Shrine Bowl week, and he looks like a really nice – space eater but i will be lying to you if i told you that i have in-depthly studied the play of northern iowa over the past two or three years so maybe the way that we are viewing christian boyd is not the way the buffalo bills are viewing christian boyd so it'll be really interesting to see what happens on draft weekend and maybe the Buffalo Bills do pull the trigger on a Jordan Jefferson or a Christian Boyd or a Fabian Lovett later on in the draft. Like some guys that we don't maybe expect them to reach for now that they have Austin Johnson and Daquan Johnson toe. So kind of spinning ourselves in circles here, but that's that's what draft season is, baby. But it's also, I think the mm -hmm. conversation is we need we need to add somebody at this position, right? And yeah. I think it's like when is the right time to do it? And do you with 11 picks as it stands right now, you mm -hmm. got, maybe you add two, right? Um, yeah. There's a comments around Eli Anku in the, in the comment section. Like I like him as a fifth guy. I don't necessarily like him as a fourth guy. He is a three hundred twenty five pound kind of Tim Settley type of guy who can do both. Right. He can tween mm -hmm. a bit, but to me, he's better suited as a run stuffer. He's not the guy that you want as a pass rushing interior defensive lineman. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to have to add somebody. You would think with 11 picks, it's a foregone conclusion that an interior defensive lineman is going to be added, but the question will be how early it's important to Brandon Bean, I mean, and I think pretty early. Mm -hmm. a, couple of, a couple of statements here, too. RJ Melville comes in and says, Tim Settle was awful here, unfortunately. Andy Swift says, yeah, Settle totally underperformed. I 100% agree, but I will say this. Quentin Jefferson underperformed here and went off and had some good seasons in the National Football League after he left Buffalo. And I think it says a lot that a guy like D'Amico Ryan's targeted Tim Settle in free agency. Cause I have a lot of respect for D'Amico Ryan's and, and what he's done with that Houston, Texas team and what he did with the 49ers defense. So for a guy like D'Amico Ryan's to go out of his way and pursue a guy like Tim Settle, I think says a lot for maybe like who Tim Settle can be. And again, that just goes to maybe the Buffalo bills are finally in a prime spot here, right? Mm -hmm. With Austin Johnson and Daquan Jones in the one tech spot to finally unleash some of these three texts. Now they just got to go forth and get their, their hands on one. And Claude Puy then comes in and says, also does Brandon Dorless stop playing around and realize he's yeah, a three tech. True. We, we had this conversation and we, we talked about Brandon Dorless and we talked about Darius Robinson on the edge show. Maybe the Buffalo bills are looking to kill two birds with one stone. Maybe they, 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 a guy like Brandon Dorless in the fourth round or a guy like Darius Robinson at 28, he can give you the best of both worlds. They can maybe give you the best of both worlds where they can play a little bit on your edge rotation. They can play a little bit more in your IDL rotation. And all of a sudden it's not a part-time player anymore because they're getting 20% of the edge rush snaps and they're getting 30% of the IDL snaps. And now they're playing 50% of the snaps. So maybe the Buffalo bills are looking for a guy who can maybe move around the defensive line a little bit. The two guys that fit that mold the most to me are Darius Robinson early and a guy like Brandon Dorless in the middle rounds of the draft. So I think Claude Puy points out another player that we did talk about in a previous show. And John Elway, or Josh Allen is the next Elway has been mentioning Darius Robinson since the since the top of the show. So 
yeah, Boy G, I think that's another Boy G can, can be a guy like that too. I think if mm -hmm. you're going later, because he did play, you know, he did play edge and then move to defensive tackle. So, yep. um, you know, he's played both. So, look, if you miss out on one of those guys early, maybe yeah. oh, another boogie match. Okay, don't <laughs> nightmares, nightmares. Okay. <laughs> uh all right ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for joining us here this evening for our defensive interior defender uh tearing show i had a lot of fun dave i hope i hope you had a lot of fun we're gonna be back tomorrow night at 9 p.m breaking down the safety class as well so things should be getting pretty interesting and then next week is when we start breaking down the first round and then the week after we're going to break down day two and then the week after we're going to break down the day three gems. So by the time we get to the NFL draft, we will have tiered almost every single position group because we're still doing those two shows a week. And we will have broken down each day of the draft and compared multiple positions to each other. So we're going to have a lot of fun here over the next three weeks. Yeah. And I, at some point we will do a mock draft. Don't worry. We'll probably dedicate like maybe <laughs> one show. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll dedicate one show to doing a, just a true mock draft, but there yeah, we go. they're, they're coming. They're coming. Don't yeah. worry. With two Enjoy. shows, like we could do a mock draft in 45 minutes, no problem. Yeah, so check us out. We'll get a mock draft. And you're going to start the mock draft Mondays up again? Tomorrow is Monday. Yeah, I think so. You're going you're gonna to you're gonna have to post one tomorrow. And I'll, I, I'll, I, I'll, I, I usually wait till April to do my first one, but I think because we're, yeah, I think tomorrow is the day. I think yeah, tomorrow is, might be the day. I've been doing tomorrow. it since January, so it's not. I have not January posted any yet. Yeah. I have not posted <laughs> any yet. As people know, I like to just do a few. I do mock draft Mondays, usually three to four weeks leading up to the draft. I do three or four. Mm -hmm. I don't just post the picks. I'll go through, put my picks with analysis and reason why, maybe throw some trades in there so that it's not just your run of the mill mock draft. So look forward to that. You look at 11 of those on a, on a graphic. I know well, there might be some, there might be some trades happening then. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll All see. right, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you tomorrow night at 9 PM. And as always, until next time, Go Bills. Go Bills. Thank you for watching tonight's episode of the Air Raid Hour. Make sure to hit that like button on the way out. If you are catching the show on demand, leave a reply in the comment section and we will respond over the course of the week. You can always listen to every episode next day on all major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify by searching Air Raid Buffalo. Thank you for your continued support, and as always, Go Bills! <laughs>